Thanks a lot, Dan. I'm just uh, really appreciate the introduction and nice to see everyone virtually. I'm just going to share my slides here. All right. Can you guys see my presenter view or my actual slides? Presenter view. Okay. How about now? Yeah, that's that's right. Good to go. Perfect. So thanks again, everyone. Um, you know, I'm going to try and keep this light, but I do have slides and I wanted to just um, take everyone through the last 10 or 15 years in Hamilton because because the, the themes are are pretty consistent across the country and across the world in terms of, you know, transitioning from the typical coronary care unit to a CICU and managing sicker patients um, in, in, in CCU. And so just as a backdrop, um, we're certainly all far from the 1960s where, you know, there used to be rudimentary telemetry and ability to defibrillate. And they were basically uh, units where you were post-infarct. We had no therapies to treat um, myocardial infarction, no real revascularization options. And you were housed in one of these units. And if you arrested, they would actually be able to defibrillate you, hopefully. Now, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, we transitioned to what many CCUs now look like. To a place where we had we could run a few drips, we could run BiPAP, you could have a feeding tube, you could have PA catheters, um, but still most of the sick patients, um, you know, the 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 really sick patients ultimately ended up in the ICU, um, and then when they got better, came back to the CCU for um, cardiology care. Many of us now have transitioned into a cardiac intensive care unit, and I'll bring you through what we've done in Hamilton. And a few, and us um, very shortly, have transitioned not only into a cardiac intensive care unit that we're dealing with, you know, intubated patients, inotropes, pressors, balloon pumps, et cetera, but um, we're verging on, you know, being able to manage our own MCS in the CCU, our own CRRT, and all of these things have been able to occur because we've populated the unit with, with staff who are comfortable with these sorts of technologies. And so we'll take, we'll go back to a history lesson, 1950, mid 1950s, 1956, Zoll actually publishes the first, um, the first um, article for patients who were successfully defibrillated out of VF with an external shock outside of an open chest. And so this kind of segued into, into the, the sort of early CCUs where again, there was no treatments really for, um, for myocardial infarction. And people started saying, why don't we invent coronary care units? And Wilburn at the AHA in the abstracts in 61 said, why don't we create a, cardi a coronary care unit that can do some of the things? We now have a defibrillator, we can monitor patients, we can respond if people have VF or um, asystole. And so they developed these units with the sole purpose of uh, rapid recognition of life-threatening arrhythmias and defibrillation. And so this um, transitioned in um, 1963 to an article that really put the coronary care unit uh, full steam ahead. And so you can see you know, how far we've come in 50 or 60 years. These were the first CCUs, and this is the schematic of Wilburn CCU, where he said, listen, let's put a, let's put a camera that looks like a movie camera in each room, uh, let's actually um, monitor the patients um, sort of via, via the video. Let's look at their ECG. Let's look at their art line and let's have a defibrillator readily accessible to all rooms and we can um, avert um, these cardiac arrests. And so this was studied in the late 60s and Killip et al said, listen, um, we're going to do a pre-post. Um, we're going to look at what patient outcomes were like before we instituted this sort of Wilburn model and after, and they actually reduce mortality um, in, in absolutely by about 20%. And sort of this, this um, transitioned many institutions to opening up coronary care units, which strictly were defibrillation and CPR units that, that helped to save lives. And then we transition to the next 20 or 30 years, which is where many people still are. And we now have therapies that can actually 
um, you know, we have primary PCI, we have uh, lytics, we have medications for tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, other therapies. And this is where CCUs kind of uh, gravitated to, but yet still the sicker patients ended up in the ICU looked after by um, general intensivists. And so when I was finishing my training um, in and around 2011, 2012, there was a real push. So when I, when I said to my program director um, in cardiology in around 2008, 2009, listen, I wanna do ICU. My program director kind of looked at me and said, that really doesn't exist. What are you thinking? Right. And so, and so it really wasn't, especially in Canada, really wasn't um, a thing back then. And as I was finishing my training, others started really pushing this and cardiology came to this sort of fork in the road where people said, we're either going to adapt and get better at managing these patients that are getting sicker in our unit, or we're going to give it up to the intensivists who are right now better able to manage these patients who are comorbid and have multi-organ dysfunction. And so there was a real push in around 2010. This is from the AHA in 2012 that basically just said, how are we going to adapt? How are we going to train um, new physicians? And how are we going to staff these units to be able to manage these patients? And so if you look at, as an example, Duke, Duke University, um, CICU, um, coronary care unit at that point in time, but from 89 to 2006, a whole host of changes that they were recognizing in their patient population. So um, now patients were having, not only were they admitted post-infarct or post-arrest, but they now had sepsis, they now had liver failure, they now needed, needed bronchoscopy and other interventions like mechanical ventilation. And so you're starting to see patient populations in high-level CCUs start to at least somewhat mirror what traditional medical ICUs um, look like. This is from Mayo Clinic, um, one of the sort of higher end CICUs uh, in North America. And you can see from 2007 to 2018 that, you know, stuff they did in terms of usual coronary interventions and geography, um, PCI, et cetera, stayed pretty stagnant, but invasive monitoring went up dramatically, PA catheters, art lines, central lines. And you can see here that ICU related interventions also went up fairly markedly, vasopressor use, mechanical ventilator use, thankfully blood transfusions went down. Um, but things we do customarily in the ICU were actually becoming more common in the CICU. And interestingly, Patients um, in terms of hospital or unadjusted hospital mortality, when you look at cardiac specific diagnosis, nothing really changed over that period of time. But many of these patients who had concomitant traditional IC related problems actually had mortality that got better over time. Probably a reflection of, you know, more physicians being trained in this regard, more equipment, uh, more comfort um, with these traditionally non-cardiac pathologies, and also nursing and allied staff who were um, coming in line with ICU sort of standards. So you can see here that not only did the pathologies get more complex, and so, you know, in, in Mayo Clinic, less uncomplicated ACS, but more heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, ventricular arrhythmias, but things like critical care diagnoses any organ failure and multi-organ failure went up two to threefold only from 2007 to 2018. So highlighting a real need to, you know, um, have physicians and teams looking after these patients who can actually manage the cardiac problem, but are also comfortable um, in, in uh, non-cardiac pathologies. Um, this was published even more recently and basically reflects exactly what our population looks like in Hamilton. Um, this is the Critical Care Cardiology Trials Network. So 20 of the higher level CICUs in North America, two or three of which are in Canada, Toronto and Edmonton contributed here. But you can see um, what types of things patients are getting in more contemporary CICUs. And these numbers mirror almost exactly what we're seeing in our, in our CCU in Hamilton. So about a third of patients have some sort of res respiratory support, 
over and above, you know, sort of traditional nasal prongs or masks in terms of mechanical ventilation, NIV, or high flow. Um, about a third have invasive hemodynamics. About a third are on some sort of drips when it comes to pressors, inotropes, or dilators. And then, you know, up to 10% have some sort of MCS, CRRT, or um, TTM, recognizing that this has likely gone down somewhat since then. Um, and so we really started to recognize that these sort of two areas, the new CICU, the traditional medical ICU are still very different in many respects, but also are starting to become more similar. And so we had to start thinking about how we were gonna tackle this problem and how we we're gonna train folks um, and upskill these units in order to um, make patients better. And so the training now, there are several pathways, but the training pathway for, People like Dan and I now function, now, now focus not only on cardiac specific stuff like we used to in cardiology, but all the stuff in ICU as well. So now you have a whole host of cardiologists who are experts in airway management, bronchoscopy, sort of neurologic um, assessments and prognostication, procedures and, and uh, on the lung in plural space, mechanical ventilation, CRT, et cetera. And so we have a whole host of people who are much more comfortable now at managing these non-cardiac um, organ dysfunction. So we published this in 2016, recognizing um, the potential need for more folks um, um, to be involved and also for units to upskill to be able to handle these patients. And so we outlined two training pathways. And the reason I highlight this, many of you probably are aware, but this, these two training pathways have made us very nimble in terms of who we can hire in Hamilton, because, you know, oftentimes there's just no CC, there's no ICU room at a particular time, but we need someone in CCU with this skill set, And so we can, we can target someone who's done a one-year critical care cardiology fellowship who doesn't command any ICU time. If there is ICU time available and the need for a cardiovascular specialist, then we can actually target someone who's duly trained. And so these are the kind of um, pathways that many people are taking nowadays. Uh, when we talked in this document, we talked about two, thing, two phenotypes who should basically populate new CICUs that manage these sort of tertiary care level patients. Uh, one would be an interventional cardiologist who manages sick patients on call, and two would be a cardiologist with some additional critical care training, whether that's one week or one year or two years. Um, and we also mandated, just like an ICU, there should be some bare minimum of weeks that clinicians do in order to maintain uh, clinical competence. So we... Um, Publish this um, in terms of what we foresaw as being a regional hub and a regional hub for, um, for high level tertiary care um, management of patients with primary cardiac problems. Okay, so I'm thinking like Ottawa Heart, I'm thinking Toronto General, I'm thinking Hamilton General, and places that if you have a primary cardiac problem and you're intubated or on pressors or in need of renal replacement therapy that you go primarily to the cardiac unit and are managed by a team that can handle all of the various um, issues that arise. Okay, and so this sort of highlights all of the things that I think um, are in place or I know are in place in London, right? 24 seven PCI, cardiac surgery, echo, um, 24 seven resident coverage, adult congenital ICU consultation, all this sort of thing are already in place and precursors for taking that next step. The next thing that was tackled and just so people understand where we're coming from, from a cardiology perspective is that we had to start speaking the language of the intensivist. And so many cardiologists, when I was first transitioning to a new, um, a new model for our CCU, many of the cardiologists were sort of um, unaware of some of the things that we talk about every day in ICU. Um, and so the language was totally different. And so we had to come up with 
protocols and procedures and checklists in order to get people on board. But the AHA has also come out with guidance for cardiology types to try and get this language in their own head, right? You see these sort of um, subtopics in this um, in this guideline, and they're all things we talk about all the time in the ICU, but aren't necessarily germane for people in cardiology. And so we're trying to get people in these high level CCUs um, speaking the same language and thinking about patients. You know, you still see it all the time in, in some CCU scenarios when the, when the clinician is focused primarily about what's going on in the chest and forget that the SATs are, the SATs are 75 or that there's, you know, the blood pressure stinks because they're, they're septic, et cetera. And so focusing on the patient, focusing on prevention of complications while in the unit um, and other things to, to help better manage the patient. And so the last thing I'll talk about before we get into the Hamilton experience is, you know, there's tons of observational data, meta-analyses that many of us in ICU always go to when we're trying to bring up ICUs that are maybe a community ICU that, cert that sends patients to us. And we always say, listen, there's, there's observational data to support a closed unit has better outcomes than an open unit. There's better outcomes probably in a high intensity unit than a low intensity unit. High intensity being fully staffed by an intensivist who's, you know, dedicated through the day, on call at night, you know, people in house to look after patients, high level uh, nursing staff, et cetera, and a multidisciplinary team. So we, we kind of think that's true in ICU and we're starting to get data to support the same sort of thing in CICU. So this is from South Korea probably the most acute CICU they have in South Korea. And in 2013, they transitioned from, you know, this is a big transition recognizing. So 2012, you were, you, uh, if you had a sick cardiology patient, it was an open unit, you would be admitted under your cardiologist and they would sort of manage you from afar with some residents. And so there may be six, eight, 10 MRPs in the unit in a classic traditional open unit. And in 2013, they transitioned to a closed unit looked after by one of two phenotypes, a cardiologist intensivist or a cardiologist dyad with an intensivist who is co-managing the patient, along with other structural changes that, um, that brought up the level of um, uh, nursing sort of uh, expertise, as well as more allied health resources and mortality went down markedly not only in the CICU, but also for these patients who made it out of the CICU, their in-hospital mortality was, was better. And so you can see, um, not only was their mortality better between 2013, before 2013 and after 2013, CV death was better, but non-CV death was better as well. Highlighting, I think that these folks were better at managing not only the cardiac problems, but the non-cardiac issues that often, um, that often plague sick cardiac patients. So let's go to um, what we've done in Hamilton. These are the best pictures I can find of Hamilton. There's no other prettier pictures that, uh, that highlight uh, Hamilton, but I always tell people that, um, that the motto of Hamilton should be better than advertised. Everyone thinks it's a, it's a dumpster. It kind of looks like one, but it's a, it's a great place to be. Um, and so I'm just going to bring you through where I, when I started in 2012 and the last 10 years in terms of where we've come. So I showed this slide before. I certainly didn't inherit the top left. What I inherited was the bottom left. I inherited a unit that primarily um, had non-intubated patients, rarely had um, inotropes and pressors, occasionally had balloon pumps, um, but was like a traditional um, sort of you know, medium end CCU. Um, and over the course of the last 10 years, we've now successfully got to this level. You know, um, we have lots of intubated ventilated patients. The most I've ever had in the CCU at one given time is 10. So, you know, we're not to the point where we have 100% occupancy of intubated ventilated patients, but um, a fair number. And as I said, we're almost, I think within a year or two, we will be here, which is gonna be an amazing feat. Um, you know, to be able to manage our own, um, to manage ourselves, um, patients on CRRT is going to be a major coup for the unit 
And also, you know, the surgeons are never terribly happy when our medical um, VA ECMO patients, whatever reason they come in in cardiogenic shock and they don't have a scar on their chest, they just take up a bed in our post-cardiac surgery ICU and potentially delay or cancel or postpone surgery. So they're never necessarily happy when our, when our medical um, MCS patients are in the CV ICU. So the plan is in the next few years to have our medical um, our, our medical MCS patients actually upstairs in our CCU. Um, 2012, um, you know, I, in talking to Dan, um, I think there are some similarities to where London's at right now. Um, but also, um, you know, I think, I think London has some, has, has done some things to, that make it better than where we we're at in 2012. So in 2012, we had 10 rooms in our CCU. Um, six of which were level two, four of which were level three. And we had 15 cardiologists, each who rounded three to four weeks a year. Um, it was well known at the time that some of the physicians were really good at managing the average patients in CCU, but not so comfortable maybe at managing the, the sicker patients, but would rely heavily on the residents and fellows to sort of, to sort of prop them up. And at that point in time, the patients in our CCU were mostly post-STEMI patients, and the minority of patients were actually critically ill. And a lot of the patients still went to ICU if they were um, beyond the scope at that point in time. So I started in 2012. I became CCU director in 2013. It became obvious in my interactions from the previous CCU director that there was a lot of people pushing for change in our CCU but it just wasn't able to happen. Internal politics, um, a whole host of reasons, just inertia for status quo sort of pervaded. Um, and so in 2013, um, you know, I met with senior leadership in the hospital and everyone recognized the problem is just how are we gonna go about fixing it? And so we elected to do an external review because internal um, sort of attempts had never worked up until 2012, 2013. And our guiding principles for the external review was that, you know, we truly felt that if you were a critically ill patient with a primary cardiac problem, you were best managed in a high functioning cardiac unit, akin to a trauma patient going to a trauma unit or a neurosurgical patient going to a, a neuro unit. But in order to, in order to uh, make that a reality, the cardiologists who are looking after these patients had to be capable of managing the sickest subset of patients in CCU. And we relied very heavily on our critical care response team physicians in the first, um, especially five years in order to sort of carry us through this with the sicker patients in, the, with, in weeks where the cardiologist didn't have um, ICU specific training. Um, we also thought back then the cardiologists were rounding in CCU and then maybe they're in the echo lab or maybe they were in the cath lab and there was a lot of division of, um, of, of their time and energies. And so we thought that was problematic and we wanted to put an end to that. And the two other guiding principles we felt were very important is that the physicians had to be able to supervise, teach, and perform all the procedures the cardiologists were expected to execute um, and be able to manage all the patients that the cardiology fellows were expected to, to manage. Um, and so with all that, the main goal was to have an exceptional training environment for cardiology fellows and rotating residents with a massive breadth of patient pathology and acuity. And so I put this letter together in, I started in July, 2020, 2013, um, officially. I put this letter together in November. It's a whole bunch of stuff I've already talked about. This is what the AHA says. This is why we need to progress in this manner. Um, this is what nursing ratio should be, et cetera. But what we really thought, I, I really wrote this for the division, but I wrote it to kind of to kind of grease the wheels of the external reviewers and say, this is sort of the documentation we've come up with. And maybe you could consider using this as a road, roadmap. Um, and, and this is sort of what, what we said. And so we said, um, we said, senior leadership in the hospital, um, senior leadership in cardiology are all on board. Our goal is to be a major tier one or tertiary quaternary care cardiac intensive care unit. That's the goal at the end of the day. And we would hope to staff it with dedicated cardiologists with ICU experience, 
Um, we wanted to collaborate very closely with intensive care physicians. We wanted to have a minimum um, amount of clinical work per year in order to maintain competence. We wanted to ensure that the docs were committed with skill levels sufficient to manage these patients. And then unlike ICU, um, which, you know, we do a great job in ICU, but one thing we, maybe you do better in London than we do in Hamilton, but one thing we don't do well um, in ICU in Hamilton is we don't follow our chronic recovered critically ill patients, right? They just kind of go out into the ether and they're ma managed by their, their family physician. And, you know, we see a ton of patients who just aren't doing all that well after their prolonged ICU stay. There's just no resources for them. So we said, listen, we're going to, we're going to actually take that on and we're going to ensure that everyone who works in our CCU has an out active outpatient clinic and are going to follow these folks closely. And so those were kind of the guiding principles that I slipped under the door of the reviewers and said, let's, 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 um, or at least consider these when you, when you um, come in to take a look at. So in terms of external review, we hired a um, cardiologist from Ottawa Heart, who was the past president of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, and so very respected guy. We had uh, Roman Yeshka, who's one of our very senior, well-respected ICU folks from St. Joe's Hospital, so another institution to come and, and look in on things, and then one of our most revered GIM uh, medicines folks who basically sat down with all of these stakeholder stakeholders over the course of a day and a half and gathered a ton of information to come up with a document. And they interviewed cardiac surgeons, they interviewed nurses, fellows, past and present, hospital leadership, and it was a fairly robust. So from that time, I had all the leadership, all my, all my chiefs um, in Hamilton since that time have all been on board. Um, we got rid of a few cardiologists um, to get down from 15 to a single digit number. Um, some of the cardiologists um, were quote unquote legacy folks who had who had kept their skills up and we um, we kept them on as and sort of grandfathered them in. But subsequent to that, we've only hired in our CCU interventional cardiologists and primarily cardiologists with critical care training. In fact, when we've gotten sicker, our, our unit has gotten sicker with more, more, more multi-organ dysfunction, more infection, more intubated patients. Interestingly, our complement of interventionalists has gone down markedly. The interventionalists were very um, comfortable when, when the unit um, was primarily a post-STEMI recovery area. But we've gone from eight interventionalists in our unit to three now. Um, and many who have left just said, you know what? Um, I used to feel comfortable in the unit and now I'm not as comfortable as I once was. Um, we do five to six weeks per year and we still have a major involvement by our um, CCRT or your CCOT um, type physician. They round on all the um, patients on mechanical ventilation or non-invasive ventilation, they bill um, the G codes for ventil the ventilatory G codes, and we have a daily case conference every day about all those patients so we can learn from each other. Um, you know, we're to the point now, we're on many weeks now that over half of our cardiologists have ICU training, that the um, CCRT docs are, are not coming up. We're just poking in to see if they can be of, of any assistance, but we've transitioned away about half the weeks to the to the CCOT MD um, being formally involved. And we've also upskilled and populated our unit with an allied health crew um, that is um, like most of what the ICUs have. So now we have 16 beds in our CCU. They're all level three. And that has mostly happened through um, good luck. I would say we've gone from four level three beds to 16. Um, a, fra a small fraction of those beds have been because of us sort of advocating and begging, et cetera. But most of it is because we kind of proved that we could manage these patients. The hospital had faith in us. And you guys know as well as I do that the ministry is always trying to get more critical care beds. And they'd come to our hospital, they'd go to other hospitals, they're doing it right now, in fact, and saying, we need more um, critical care beds in the province. And many hospitals, including our own, were like, great, but we don't have the infrastructure. The ministry wanted to give them money to run these beds, but not money for capital or 
um, bricks and mortar. And so every time they came to our hospital and said, guys, can you take two more beds, uh, two more level three beds? We'd say, sorry, we can only accommodate one, but maybe we can put one in CCU. And so over the course of 10 years, that enabled us to go from four to 16 level three beds. And that's a heck of a lot of money um, um, that, you know, clearly level three beds are funded at a different rate than level two beds. We have nine cardiologists. Our patient population is totally different. Some of our low risk STEMI patients don't ever see the light of CCU. All of our procedural structural patients used to come to CCU, only about 15 or 20% now come to CCU. 80% of TAVR, MitraClip, TriClip, Watchmen, all of those things don't ever see CCU. Um, and we have the whole host of cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shock, you know, arrhythmias, et cetera. Um, just so you can, I, I picked pre-pandemic because things change. Uh, things were kind of muddy in the pandemic, as you guys can imagine. But just so you're aware of where we stand, these are level three units in teaching hospitals in the province. The vast majority are ICUs. A few are CCUs. And these are all anonymized. So all I know is the units at Hamilton General. And some of these are your units in, in London. So, you know, certainly not the most acute patients with an overall mortality of 5%, but in line with many, many of the, IC, the, the academic ICUs in the province, certainly not near our neurotrauma ICU, um, but certainly more than many of the other ICUs. We have about a 25, now 30%, if you look at our most recent data, um, ventilate, uh, vent, uh, about 30% of our patients are actually ventilated at any given time. Again, not dissimilar to many ICUs um, at uh, teaching hospitals. And what is a struggle for us is that we consistently have the busiest unit, big catchment area, the most unit admissions and discharges per quarter, quarter over quarter over quarter. So a very busy high acute, a high acuity unit. And so this is sort of what our complement of folks looks like in CCU now. Okay, and so we have our three interventionalists. We have one of our legacy docs here who's an adult congenital guy, who's an echo guy, um, who's, who's just sort of like the mentor of everyone who's kept up his skills. And so he still, he still rounds in CCU. And as you can see, more than 50% of our unit, actually more, a higher percentage than any other CCU I'm aware of in the world of people with ICU training. And, and a unique sort of um, training experience. So Gabe here is one of our EP guys. He was an EP doc for two or three years with us. Loved to work in CCU. And we said, Gabe, we got to follow the rules. If you want to work in CCU, I know you have a passion for sick patients. You got to do the training. And so we, through AFP, got him, paid, paid him a salary. He went to Toronto, did the one-year critical care cardiology fellowship, came back. We've hired him. He's been an amazing addition to our group. Mike Sang, interventionalist. He's seven years into his career, had a bit of a midlife crisis, wanted to look after a bigger breadth of patients. He's actually just finishing. He took a year off. He did our, our critical care cardiology fellowship that we started. And so now he is joining our CCU um, group as an interventionalist with critical care experience. Faison, Emily and I all did ICU as well as cardiology. Faison, did a fellowship in advanced heart failure, VADs, and uh, and transplant. Emily's like our PhD research um, extraordinaire who's just publishing like crazy. And if you look at all the critical care folks in, in Hamilton, I'm 45 and I am by far the oldest. <laughs> um, and so I'm kind of the grandfather in the critical care cardiology group. But the good thing is because we can, as I said before, because we can adapt and get people into the fold, um, whether or not there's ICU uh, availability, really only three of us command ICU time here, right? And so, so if we had no ICU time and uh, ICU was full in terms of, in terms of the uh, attendings, we could still fully staff our CCU with all the great people who are coming through this one year fellowship program. And so to last few slides, We've come a long way. We have a ton of infrastructure. We have a ton of people who are all um, super easy to work with and who I think manage these sick cardiac patients um, really well. And that's allowed us to do some really good things. So now, in addition to 
um, in addition to Edmonton and Toronto, we now officially have a one-year critical care cardiology fellowship, four cardiologists, six blocks of ICU, a block of anesthesia, a block of respirology, two blocks of advanced heart failure, um, VAD, uh, MCS in Toronto, and a host of electives. And so that we now have two fellows who have gone uh, through the program. We have we have been able to attract many people with a cardiac focus who want to do ICU, and um, it's amazing how many people are coming through. So every year we almost always have one cardiology trainee. Dan just finished. There's someone in second year cardiology. There's someone in first year cardiology. And believe it or not, three out of the five spots for the incoming class are our cardiology trainees. And in fact, going through um, and interviewing um, for ICU this year, um, the second most common prototype applying to ICU outside of GIM was not eMERGE, was not respirology, was not anesthesia, it was actually cardiology. Um, where are we going in the very near future? So the only patients that land in CCU who don't finish their course in CCU are people who need CRRT. Um, and in the next six months, we have an RFP process in line. We are going to now have CRRT in CCU. In the next one to two years, hopefully we'll be able to manage our own MCS in CCU. And I expect we'll be able to hire at least one or two more cardiac intensivists in the next one to two years, or next five years, sorry. Lastly, we've been also able to do super exciting things uh, along with London, uh, sorry, along with Ottawa and Toronto, we've been able to um, develop a code shock team. A code shock team has been shown to improve outcomes um, in observational data, but this is a team where patient with suspected cardiogenic shock comes in, an all call goes out for a quick Zoom meeting um, with a shock team with a whole host of um, critical care experts with a focus on cardiology, rapid evaluation, hemodynamic assessment, echo, et cetera, and then a therapeutic um, a decision is made. Interestingly, um, outcomes seem to be better. And ironically, overall MCS rate it, um, tends to be lower in people who are managed by a code shock algorithm. And you can see in the algorithm that about the first three or four steps in this algorithm all go through the CCU fellow and staff person before it ever gets to a cardiac surgeon, a perfusionist, our ECLS team, et cetera. So last slide, um, here are the benefits, I think, of a highly functional level three CCU. Um, uh, patients with a primary cardiac pathology are managed by cardiovascular experts, certainly with the help in many scenarios of, of, um, of the ICU experts um, to help with the non-cardiac stuff. Um, we have less movement between ICU and CCU. If you land in CCU at, and the, you finish your course in CCU, there are very few things that we need to move people to the ICU for. We've been able to accrue more ministry funding and our level three footprint um, by funneling the level three beds up to CCU. I think we're more adaptable. Our CCU nurses are in line in terms of training and experience and comfort with sick patients with our ICU colleagues. And so our nurses swap back and forth all the time and our patients do. And oftentimes I'll have a post-cardiac surgical patient in CCU or they'll have a post-STEMI patient in post-cardiac surgery ICU and our patients can easily transition between the two. And we, we look after them ourselves if they're in our own unit. The training experience I think is better. We actually now have ICU fellows who round in our CCU because they don't get enough cardiac critical care in the ICU. And the consistency week to week has been like immeasurably better. It's almost like plug and play. And you guys probably work in some units where you know that if you get handover from so-and-so, you're just gonna pick up the baton and go and it's gonna be like nothing changed. And so every week now in CCU, it's literally like we're just picking up from, from ourselves, although we're more refreshed because we're just starting. And so it's really made a massive difference. And so that's sort of the maturation um, over the course of the last 10 years. And I will stop and take any questions. Right, thank you very much for uh, 
an amazing talk that very much is in keeping with the spirit of uh, the sort of radical new introduction of ideas and, and moving things forward. Um, that was, it was great. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that we have a mixed audience from both uh, critical care and cardiology from our own center in London. Um, is a great sort of jumping off point to, to move into discussion. Um, I know uh, Dr. Hedera contacted us earlier about uh, maybe opening with questions and I see uh, Dave Nightfall as well in line uh, also, but uh, while I know you wanted to, uh, to start the question period with some discussion. Sure, thank you, John. And thank you, Craig, great to see you. And thank you very much for making the time. Um, I, I mean, I, it's uh, maybe a little bit of a provocative question. Um, I'll preface it by saying that I think the way you've, you, you talk about the organization of the CCU in Hamilton really seems to avoid some of the challenges elsewhere. And you know, I'm specifically thinking about the Ottawa model where it's just a completely different world that is, you know, that is separated from uh, the rest of the critical care uh, environment. Um, the and I, you know the, my other preface would be to say that you know we're definitely interested in moving forward towards a model of care for our cardiac uh, patients that uh, sounds very much like what you're trying to do. That's uh, you know Dan's uh, challenge going to be over the next few years to try and come up with uh, with a model that um, that can work. Um, but maybe to be a little bit provocative. Uh, I mean, the inclination that everybody seems to have is to create a unit for X. So neuro ICU, uh, transplant ICU, surgical ICU, um, cardiac surgery ICU, cardiac ICU. And I wonder if um, the, the a more traditional basic model of um, having cardiac intensivists, people who've done cardiology and intensive care, who do you know, um, focused QI work within the general IC environment to develop those protocols, to upskill the nurses, to um, to actually move along the care of the, the patient population in question. Uh, the dividend, of course, being that, uh, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, you don't lose that experience of caring for those patients so that your trainees and maybe your core ICU physicians are experiencing or looking after these patients less and less, you know? Um, so I'll leave it at that. I mean, the question really is about, you know, is there a way of mitigating the loss of experience across the continuum of the intensivists and the nurses? Um, uh, you know, and I think you, you kind of sort of uh, recognize some of those things in, in your model, but curious to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, no, it's a it's it's a great question, and and we we struggle with this. We we you know I work in our post cardiac surgery unit, and and we started with with ten folks um, when I started, and mostly mostly generalists. And now with with the exception of one person, we're all cardiovascular specialists who work in the in the post cardiac surgery ICU, um, and you know of course when you when you work there, you think that. You think that um, you know it's the best care for patients, but there, I think there's still room for the generalist. But what I can tell you from personal experience is that for 10 years, I did CCU, postcard surgery ICU, general ICU, and neurotrauma ICU, and um, I felt I could do laps around many people in CCU and CV ICU, and I felt that I was, um, you know, I felt that I was at best average in the other units. And I thought many others were better at managing um, a subarachnoid or better at managing an acute trauma. Not that I was terrible, but just that, you know, um, you know, a, a trauma surgeon intensivist versus me, a cardiologist general um, intensivist, you know, I would readily admit, I didn't think I could hold a candle to them. And so, and so, you know, that's my opinion, but I'm not sure it's right or not. And I'm not sure it's better for patient care, but um, that's sort of the philosophy we've, we've gone forward with. Yeah, no, I mean, I, and I think that's, um, you know, that is, that is exactly why people are moving towards uh, different models, right? Um, I just want to, before I, I let Dave ask his question, uh, um, 
want to recognize some of the traders on this call. Um, maybe initials A, C, but we won't elaborate on the inside joke. <laughs> um, Dave, I know you had your I just wanted to listen to that last week. Yeah, um, Craig, uh, nice talk. And um, more importantly, great job over the last 10 years to upskill your CICU. Actually, I was thinking of the same kind of issue that Wael was talking about mm -hmm. um, and pretty much exactly what you were thinking about as um, acute care cardiologist intensivist, you felt less sort of comfortable in a trauma ICU. However, when there are cardiac issues in that ICU, those patients probably on average got better care. And so how do you suppose um, going forward, we balance that aspect of care for all patients, um, making sure your medical surgical patients get great cardiology care, but also making sure your CICU patients get great general ICU care. It's good that the three of you rotate in ICU, but uh, at some point, do you feel like that might be an issue for either side of that coin? It, it could be, but it, it could be, but I think, um, is that me or someone? Do I have feedback from someone else? Yeah, that's better. Um, it's it's a it's a good question. Um, you know, I think it would be, you know, maybe thankfully, um, most high end CICUs are not in isolation. They're in uh, buildings like your buildings, our buildings that have two, three, four intensive care units. And so, you know, I would argue, Dave, that you know, I probably do. 15 or 20 consults a week when I'm in CCU or post cardiac surgery ICU in the general ICU, um, you know, at any one given time in our unit, I'm probably, I'm sure like you guys do, there's an anesthesiologist in one unit, there's a cardiologist in another unit, there's a neurosurgeon in another unit and a trauma doctor in another unit. And so we're always sort of talking and asking for each other's help. Um, I could see it being problematic if I was by myself um, with no other with no other resources but i don't find it problematic in in how we've we've hired a broad swath of individuals with a variety of skill sets in our units yeah i think that's wonderful so whereas in some units for example ours we have a broad spectrum of specialties and that's how we improve the average care as a whole uh, in your situation, it sounds like you have close collaboration with intensivists of different stripes across the units, kind of accomplishing the same thing. That's great. And I don't know what I don't know what the right answer is, Dave, but um, it sounds like you guys are highly functional, and we consider ourselves highly functional. So maybe it's just two different ways of managing these patients. Correct. What, 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 what oh. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Mike. Yeah, please go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm one of the interventionists here and, and one of the attendings in the CCU at University Hospital. And, um, you know, for a while here, we've been talking about upscaling things in our CCU. Um, and I'd be curious to hear from you about kind of the, the landscape of the times, because uh, for us, we don't feel like it's a physician restriction. Like a, you know, your talk was fantastic, but it was very physician based about you know, what is the, the expertise at the physician level? What is the knowledge level? But you know, the reality at the ground on a daily day basis is often that nursing, um, perfusion, RT, all these things need to be set into place. And I'd be curious to hear your experience in Hamilton about how all that was facilitated because that also requires a huge investment from a hospital perspective that's quite separate from the physician perspective, right? When we think about it, and it's not about the physician expertise, it's about what is the investment in the hiring policies and so on and scheduling and so on about um, the, the, the various other care uh, providers on the team. Um, and so um, I'd be curious to see kind of what, what has been facilitated at the high administrative level for you guys to be able to make such instrumental changes over such a short period of time? Yeah, no, it's 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 all great points. Um, you know, the main thing is that, you know, the reason I focused on the physicians is that 
someone has to take the bull by the horns and start making um, making progress. Um, and so in our particular scenario, it was it was the physicians. Um, however, you know, the bottom line is that um, is that they're all kind of interconnected as you're as you're intimating there. So, you know, you really can't do this until you get level three beds because there's no hospital administrator who's going to on the shoestring budget of level two. Um, it's a fraction of what you get for level three. And so, you know, you cannot have one to one or one to two nurses on a level two budget. And but you can't justify level three potentially beds without an infrastructure in place in order to manage patients who are level three, um, you know, uh, illness severity. So it's one of those things where they all interplay with one another. And in our particular scenario, we just, the physicians happen to take the, the you know, take it on. Um, but you're right, all these things have to come together. But I think the biggest thing is just taking advantage of those level three beds. And those mostly came to us just because there's no other place to put them. It wasn't because we were making massive pushes, just because we had a bit of infrastructure in place, um, a bit more confidence in us that we could manage these sicker patients. I said, okay, let's just start shunting all the level three beds up to CCU. In fact, we got to the point where, where they were using the arrest bed from, that was traditionally an ICU. They said, okay, we're gonna fill that with level three um, money. And we're gonna make, we have confidence enough in CCU that we're gonna make that the general arrest bed. Um, and, so, and so most of this just happened because, because we couldn't expand enough to, to accommodate all the level three asks for the ministry. Uh, Dr. Smith, I saw you had a question in line there. I think you may still be muted. Just uh, maybe unmute the microphone. All right. Great talk, Craig. I, I think everything you said uh, from my, my involvement with the ministry as well as uh, previous experience doing some of these things uh, is actually right on. It's a very uh, difficult process, takes a long time, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not going to, I think a lot of the questions actually that Michael asked is really what I was going to ask about, but I'll just put my two cents in two for what uh, Yael and uh, Dave said. And I think really supportive of what you just said. I'm probably the one with the oldest one here with the longest experience doing everything. So mm -hmm. I started off doing intervention, then got forced to train to TE and all these things. And the reality is, I think all of us who've been practiced for a while realize that technology changes a lot. So yes, I was trained in TE, but as time goes on, I can't be doing transplant heart player, TE, doing a cath lab, doing all these other things and think I'm gonna be really good at doing what I do. Mm -hmm. So you can keep up general TE skills. I'm, I'm, I feel quite comfortable, but I can't, you know, a lot of the other echo skills, maybe not. So I don't do that. And I look at my own field of heart failure transplant right now, I think Brian can say the same thing. Heart player is really quite, there's a lot of options available and the technology is changing at a rapid rate, even amongst the VATs, how we manage the VATs. So I think, unfortunately, whether you like it, there'll be some areas where we probably need to have subspecialization to a greater degree to feel comfortable because we see scenarios in our own CCU when we're doing CCU here, where our colleagues are not comfortable with a VAD stuck in there. Uh, or a really advanced heart failure patient stuck in there. And so I think, unfortunately, you know, the generalist, there is a role for the generalist, but then there's probably also a role for uh, more subspecialty training and more dedicated units in certain cases. I think we uh, have a question in line from Dr. Cameron next as well. Uh, hi again. Uh, thanks again for that for that talk. I guess I had two questions. What what do you think the secret sauce is? Like, why would you suggest, or why would you imagine that outcomes would be better for cardiac patients with cardiologists? Is maybe self evident, but is it uh, is it a knowledge and skills element? Is it like an access, sort of who you're seeing in the hallway or who's filtering through? So just if you have a sense of what the mm -hmm. what the delta is attributable to. And then my second question is just uh, if you were to do this transition and that you kind of spoke to it in your own experience, but is a clean break, like just have all of that level three ventilator stuff completely independent, a good way of going about it? Or do you think like a transition and you mentioned your CCRT docs coming through, like, does that just make it sort of your half, your half pregnant almost? Or do you think uh, that's <laughs> a, a halfway way of doing it? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. I'll start with your last question first. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine going from level two to all level three uh, in one shot. It, it would just not have been possible for us. Um, we transitioned this, you know, almost over 10 years. And, and I think I, I wouldn't have wanted to go much faster, quite honestly. Um, and and, and um, it seemed to have gone by very quickly, but it's 10 years. And, uh, and um, I wouldn't have done it too differently. You know, in terms of in terms of you know why I think cardiology cardiology may do better in these particular patients is, you know, I just I couldn't the reason I don't do general ICU anymore and especially neurotrauma, as Stuart was saying, even when I'm in the even when I'm in the uh, the echo lab, like I do half the amount of echo as all the other academic echocardiographers and. Like every day, I feel like I'm struggling to keep up. There's just so much information just in echo. And cardiology probably has the most amount of new stuff, new trials, new whatever. Um, and so, so like, I just don't know how as a generalist looking after all of those other things, how you would be able to keep up with the massive amount of stuff. I couldn't, I couldn't keep up with echo, cardiology, outpatient stuff, um, neurotrauma, burns. I just couldn't, I didn't have the bandwidth. Um, and, uh, and there was just so much stuff in cardiology that I just couldn't keep up with. Even in our post-cardiac surgery ICU, now half of us are cardiologists. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know if we do any better, quite honestly, at, at managing the patient's post-cardiac surgery. What I think we do a better job at, which I think we fail a lot of our patients at, is transitioning from chronic cardiologists, from acute post-cardiac surgery to chronic cardiovascular care. That subacute process, I would argue all day that we do a better job because that's all we do, right? And so, so like before we started, things like you know, RNAs and MRAs and SGLT2 inhibitors and all these things would never have flown in our post-cardiac surgery ICU. Um, but now they do, right? Um, and so I just think I, 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 I would never contend that I'm better at the first 24 hours at managing a post-cardiac surgery patient than a cardiac anesthetist. But where I do think we make a difference is in that transition out of the ICU to give them a better shot at staying on the ward once they go there. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll give it back to John, but I think that, uh, yeah, that, that highlights the issue of cardiology is that too many trials are positive. There are too many drugs to know, whereas ICU is the opposite problem. There's just really nothing that works, so there's not much to know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, question from Dr. Goodell, who uh, identified previously as an interloper who has invaded us from Atlanta, Canada, but is always welcome back to ask a question. Uh, I'm a cardiologist who did my intensive care training at London, so they've graciously allowed me to spill some of my keys down my front while I ask a question sort of thing. Um, I, I have the, sort of two questions. One, um, uh, just in the last six months that I've been in practice, we're doing more trachs in the CCU, things like that, and that leads to downstream chronic critical care patients, patients who, you know, you go off service mm -hmm. and you're not maybe looking after them. They don't have enough uh, as much familiarity on, say, the nursing floor and physicians, so how do you guys deal with the fact that their critical illness may be over, but, you know, they still have the sorts of things that people are less comfortable managing. And then my second question was just from a practical perspective, we uh, exist in a practice model where there's a number of physicians providing coverage. Um, when you sort of phased down or pared down, was it um, uh, a, a rapid shift in that, okay, you guys are cut, like the team is posted on the door sort of thing, or did the acuity sort of self-select out physicians who were better suited to serve in that environment? Yeah, it was, there was not a roster placed on the door, that's for sure. Um, there was three, there was three camps of people. There were people who are clearly uncomfortable and identified on the external review. There were people in the middle, and then there were people who are clearly comfortable and should stay on the team. And so, you know, I was a year in as, as you know, an attending. And so thankfully I had, you know, a really, really good chief of staff and a really good chief of um, cardiology. And we had to have some very, very difficult conversations with two or three um, or four people um, to help them transition out. Um, the rest occurred, you know, um, over time via attrition. As I said, many of the interventionalists left, um, which was surprising to me. I wouldn't have expected that. 
Um, and so it, it, it wasn't a rapid transition. Three or four people left early in 2014, and then the rest was through attrition. Um, your chronic, uh, you, you mentioned traits in the CCU and chronicity. It's interesting how the other thing about cardiac critical care is how you have to develop um, a comfort with things that you were talking about, right? So um, Gabe Acosta, the EP guy that I was talking about, and I now do all of our own stellate ganglion blocks. Where we started doing with one of the surgeons only our own trachs because you guys probably know just as well as I do that good luck finding an ENT doc to do a trach on someone on aspirin and Tykeg. Good luck finding an anesthetist to do a stellate ganglion block in someone on a, you know a dual pathway approach with a NOAC and clopidogrel. And so we've actually had to sort of now that we have a critical mass of people, we've actually started to do these things um, on our own. Um, in terms of developing, um, in terms of developing a comfort, um, that's one of the hardest things with developing a comfort with chronic critical illness. So a long stayer in CCU used to be like three days, right? They'd come in with their STEMI, they'd go home 24 to 48 hours later or get repatriated. That was, you know, if they were there more than that, they were a long stayer. Well, now we have to get used to, now we have many situations where we have people who are chronically ventilated or, or have chronic non-cardiac issues that lead to them being in the unit for an extended period of time. And what we've tried very hard to do is not, you know, we've tried to avoid the urge of just sending them down to ICU to be managed there because we need to get comfortable with them, right? That my first few years, that was always, a, oh, patient's been here a week, let's move them to ICU. And, and we've resisted that sort of temptation to do so in order to get comfortable, but also not to sort of, you know, push these patients onto, onto other units. That's great, thanks. Um, I know we're sort of moving towards the end of the time that we had scheduled originally for this discussion, but I'd be happy to entertain the last one or two questions if anyone else uh, has anything else they want to ask Dr. Ainsworth. That's great. Um, you know, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, obviously, great discussion stimulated by by virtue of the presentation that you shared. We really appreciate you uh, spending time with us and and sort of bringing to light what you've been working on so much for the last 10 years. Uh, it's, it's very exciting to hear about and obviously is, is going to generate a lot more discussion beyond the, the forum that we've gathered for this evening. So mm -hmm. thanks very much for your time. You're welcome, guys. Appreciate it. And nice uh, meeting all virtually. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Take care, guys.